perspective as well as how to uh, understand our perspective among other hermeneutics, you know. And uh, I've been thinking that through myself, and um, I don't know if I can put it into words, but it's almost like if I was to if I was to put together uh, a sermon prep, right? And trust me, I'm not I'm not writing sermons right now. I'm not I'm not a pastor. But if I was to put together <laughs> a sermon prep, and I was to follow a particular steps to the best of like a biblical theology would kind of flow with overarching, let's just say overarching biblical ideas. Um, I've been thinking on how would that sermon prep look from say page one to 10 on any given pericope or, or given section of scripture. Like, and as you kind of flow through page one to page two through page three, it kind of addresses each overarching, um, the, the wide art overarching biblical themes and then the more intricate contexts, you know what I mean? But from a new covenant perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's good. So like a, a survey of biblical theology, basically. So you're basically, thinking of basically and like kind of how you guys were talking last week, sometimes. Um, or maybe there would be a way to uh, like one section would be any or any quote or all quotes from that section of text that are quoted by the New Testament writers and how they view that that section, like kind of like as it flows even in a backwards direction. <clears throat> what do you mean by backwards direction? So if I was if I was reading um, a section of text in the Old uh, Testament and then I find quotations in the in, in the New Covenants or the New Testament from the Christ or the apostles kind of explaining that text or at least utilizing it for an overarching point. Okay. Like it would be cool to kind of incorporate into that mm -hmm. sermon prep, if you know what I mean. Yeah. 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 New Covenant theology sermons. Yeah. It's the, the typical Old Testament sermons you get are. <sighs> It might be, they're kind of, to my mind, a mixture of Jewish sermons and Christian sermons, a mixture of purely Old Testament for the Jews and New Covenant, New Testament application, rather than, rather than being primarily uh, get looked at from the New, New Testament's uh, perspective uh, and through therapeutic. Right. It's yeah. almost like the first Corinthians 10, the apostle talks about these things were done, you know, so uh, for, for our, for our learning. Example. Right. example, right. And uh, it's like, what a, what a great way to look back and say, okay, I can extrapolate, I can, I can draw from this with the revelation I have in the new. Yeah. Hey, Christopher, you missed a bit. No, I was, I was listening. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> what? I'm only joking. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, speaking of that, I was, because I, I read, I read Genesis chapter 17 today. You know, the, the covenant, the second, well, the renewal, I guess mm -hmm. it's, it's the renewal of the covenant with, with Abraham right. by God. And, and Paul quotes quotes from that chapter in Romans 4 saying, you know, uh, he was circumcised after the promise was given. And the circumcision was a sign of the, was a seal of the covenant that, that God had made with him mm -hmm. in order that, that he'd be, the, he'd be the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that the promise would be fulfilled that was told him that you will be the father of many nations. Yeah, sir. So, I mean, just for exa an example. Oh, yeah. An example of an, uh, an Old Testament reading or New Testament reading? A New Testament reading. You know, Romans, Romans 4's interpretation of, of Genesis 17. Romans 4 interpretation. Yeah. 
Do you, did you ever notice about that interpretation? Um, how, if you if you look at Gen uh, Romans four, it talks about faith as being justifying faith. Mm -hmm. We associate justifying faith with coming to believe in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Abraham was already a believer. Mm -hmm. David decided he was already a believer. It, it's interesting how two believers who have been believers for many years, are, uh, their Old, Old Testament settings as believers are chosen by Paul to reflect justification by faith as being something well, as we today would consider to be uh, something that happens at the very, very, very initial stage, very start hmm. of faith. Excuse me. Hello? Nobody. A telemarketer? You're doing a prank call. Oh. The, the, the warranty on your vehicle is almost up. <laughs> yeah. So I, I find uh, I find that a very uh, that's a fascinating um, factor uh, as to how Paul perceives the Old Testament and justification by faith. Mm -hmm. How he is looking upon it, and perhaps even giving us an insight <laughs> into uh, the, the Old Testament thought about it. Um, can, is Paul is Paul looking at justification by faith as a kind of static? concept that is kept within the first moments of coming to faith in Jesus. Is that the way he views it? Um, or, or is there something more to it than, than that idea? Well, yeah. I would just say it's an, it's an interesting thought. I mean, as you kind of come down through that progressive revelation, you see uh, you see that the, those within the new covenant having that that faith is, is a, uh, the regeneration. The faith is is directly connected to what they knew about Jesus, right? Meanwhile, back in the old, we have Abraham with his promises, believing and trusting in God, a faithful man, received. And then, uh, and then he received that what circumcision as a sign and seal, like Christopher said. And it's the funny thing is, Abraham is the only guy, right, that we read about that received circumcision as a sign and a seal. And um, a lot of people, I think, want to equivocate what uh, what Abraham received into other ordinances. Baptism is a sign and a seal. Or this is a sign and a seal. You know what I mean? And it's like, no, that was that was for Abraham. And that was, uh, as it kind of went through the Abrahamic covenant, right? You had that um, that two sides of the same coin. You have the, the physical people and the spiritual people. And the physical people are, are of course, fleshly circumcised. Um and then you have a spiritual side of the coin, um, which which is directly uh, opposed to the flesh. It's talking about you know spiritual circumcision, but um, I, I I'm trying to connect the point here you were making about um, what did Abraham uh, what did, how was that moment of faith perceived? You know, for him. Trusting in God, it, trusting in God enough to put his own son on the altar, right? As Paul, as Paul brings him up in the new covenant. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's all. That's another interesting application. You're talking about the sign and the seal. Yeah, the I, I have I have thought long and hard for decades now about this issue because having been brought up, up in the reform model where uh, and the standard evangelical position that justification is viewed as, uh, of course, once for all, but stationary at the beginning. It kind of has its, its moment there when you come to faith. And um, of course, I'm, I'm, that's fine. But it isn't exactly everything that Paul is Paul is suggesting something more to it there in Romans 4. There's a there's an angle or a, a shade to it that we typically have not we have not really uh, appreciated. Um, I suspect because the version of justification by faith handed down to us has come from Luther and the reformers and the they, they very strongly answered the, the Roman Catholic view right. correctly, of course, but yeah. So, <clears throat> you were going to say something? No, and you go, bro. I was going to ask you, are you suggesting something like what the Roman Catholics say, um, uh, where you can increase your justification? No. Oh, okay. No, no nothing like that. Well, I, are you... I, 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 am, I am saying that I am saying that if you read Luther, if you read Calvin, both of them talked about Luther. Luther spoke about continuous justification, the sense <laughs> of you came to God for forgiveness, you were being constantly justified in a smaller sense. I think his type of theology there would be the equivalent of when Jesus says, you've all been washed, mm -hmm. you don't need to be washed except your feet. Yeah. And Luther's view is you've been justified, you don't need to con constantly, you don't need to be justified again, except your feet, as it were, you need to be forgiven and therefore mm -hmm. Whereas Calvin, and that, that's Luther's view, but Calvin's view is different again. But he's also got this element of an ongoing sense of justification, meaning justification is like an umbrella that covers from A to Z of your faith. It's not just a pinpoint doctrine there at the beginning of your Christian life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, it's the safety net of God. It's his covering on you from A to Z, from beginning to end. It's a once-for-all event in Christ that covers you the whole way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah you, that makes sense. You walk in that, and if you look at, and I think Calvin is right. I think Calvin's view there is right. I, I understand where uh, Luther is coming from, um, and I appreciate his point, and it's similar, but I think it goes a bit too far. Um, but but then again, uh, it, you know, it's there's parts of it appeal to me, but neither one is arguing for anything like the Roman Catholic view. Mm -hmm. uh, and Cal I like Calvin's because if you look at the uh, Romans four and even Romans one, Romans one seventeen, the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. uh, the righteousness of God is real from heaven, from faith to faith. And it, it means that you are constantly participating. I, I think part of the meaning, I should say, along with Calvin, is that you're participating in that righteousness and that justification from that every moment that you're living by faith and relying mm -hmm. upon God by faith, you're you are relying on that justification that's been provided for you in Christ. Yes, you, it was given to you once and for all, 
but it's a living, real thing. And the problem mm -hmm. I always had with the reformed Ordo Salutis, and I did my PhD in that, so excuse me <laughs> if I've, I've been thinking about it for decades, is that it was just a, it's a little thing, when I say little, I mean in terms of this, the wider scope of Calvin's argument, it's just a one pinprick thing that happens at the beginning, mm -hmm. and that's it. And it has no cone effects. But Calvin is saying, mm, yeah, okay, but not really. It depends what you mean, because it's like a, it's like one of these defensive domes that covers you from A to Z. And it's always there and it's active and buzzing. It isn't just active when you first become a believer and then the effects of it fall on. No, the thing itself is with you from beginning to end. Right. And I found that exceedingly powerful back in the day. I was going up and down between him and Luther. And I couldn't make my mind up. But <laughs> I, I, I think uh, when I look at Calvin's view, and I look at Romans one seventeen, I look at Genesis seventeen. I, I think that's. I, I think that really, probably Calvin has it, and we've got. We've got justification by faith. Yes, has been definitive and once and for all, but paradoxically, it's accompanying you every single day. And I don't mean in terms of the knock-on effect. I mean it's actively working every single day. That's powerful. What do you What do you mean by working? Well, <clears throat> it means that uh, in the same way as David. As David says, um, let me as, let me uh, go up Romans four. The best way to the best way for me to explain it is to uh, there's David. Uh, so there's Paul. He's writing to. The Romans, mixture of predominantly Gentiles and Jews. Mm -hmm. He's teaching them about how salvation has come to both Jew and Gentile. He, he speaks about Abraham and Abraham receiving the promise, and that uh, he he had faith and the righteousness that goes with it before he was circumcised. Big deal because of the Jewish view of the law. But then he speaks of uh, David as well, uh, verse 6. The blessing on the, on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. David, at this point, is already a believer. Now, our standard model is what? <laughs> you, you are justified when? When you come to faith in Jesus Christ. That is the standard model. It's in all the traditional ordo salutuses. <laughs> That's it. There's no idea then of that justification having some sort of um, life outside of that moment, as it were. It happens then, that's its place, it stays there. Hey, brother. Howdy. How's it going? It's going well. How about y'all? Doing all right. I've yeah, started okay. to use that word there, uh, y'all. Doesn't sound good for when I, I use it right enough. <laughs> I mangle it. The the only person I think in this group that could legitimately use that word is Curtis. Because he's yeah, in he's South Carolina. Yeah, he's, I'm, he's, learning <laughs> I'm learning lots of new vernacular down here. <laughs> yeah. Pertinier. Pertinier's is a word to kind of describe almost. Um uh, polecat. <laughs> polecat. polecat. Polecat is a skunk. Um, <laughs> they say water spigot. You go water spigot. But uh, yeah, anyway. Um, I, I think what, you, what you're talking about, justification in that sense, it's, it, there could be a possible possibility that, you know, we always talk about being uh, having that positional righteousness, that, you know, being positionally justified. Sometimes I think in our minds, we uh, we take our our, our limited language and we think oh well you know i i've i'm 
I'm that's it. I'm justified. It's done. And now I'm on to, you know, I'm on to other avenues of, of right. uh, well, Christian. Really, you're on to sanctification. And, and all yeah. that, uh, all that's true. Right. Um, Paul has got a different appreciation because see in Romans 4, if you read the whole of Romans 4, it's, it's about justification by faith, but it's speaking right. about the life of faith mm-hmm. and the righteousness that accompanies Abraham. Abraham the righteous. Mm-hmm. It's not something that can be said merely of Abraham when he becomes justified by faith as we conceive of it in a traditional world. Well, Angus, could you, could you read it? Or so one, of us, one, one of us read it? Uh, the, the Romans four, yeah. Or, what or the, or the whole, either the whole either the whole passage, either the whole passage, either the whole passage or the re, or the relevant parts of it. Uh, well, yeah, okay. I mean, you can read it if you want, brother. When you go, you want me to? Yeah. The whole pa- the whole chapter. Uh, if you want, yeah. I mean, I can read. I can read only part of it if you want. If you want me to. Uh, well, I, mean, if I, I was focused in on David uh, originally. Uh, you could read those verses about David. Okay. So uh, verses 5 to 8? Or um, Yeah, that's fine. Or five, five, to ni- 5 to 9, maybe? Yeah, whatever. No, I'll start at 4. I'll start at 4. 4 to 9. All right. Verses 4 to 9. Uh, I'm using the New American Standard, 1995. Uh, It says, now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Yes. Uh, uh, Dale, sorry, to give you just a little bit of background, we were talking about Genesis 17 to begin with. And I had mentioned, have you ever noticed how and, and Christopher, I mentioned Romans 4 reading of Genesis 17. And I said, well, have you ever noticed how in Romans 4, Paul talks about justification by faith. And he uses two examples of two godly men. And yet the traditional ordo salutis is that uh, those who are justified, uh, well, that happens once and for all when you first believe. It then has knock-on effects. The the value of that re, re, is retained, but it's, <laughs> then you're on to sanctification and all the rest of it. That's a traditional ordo salutis, and I'm saying that in Romans four, Paul has a different approach. That yes, you're justified by faith, and by the way, I'm following Calvin's model here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that justification is like a it's like a, a safety arc that covers you from A to Z and you're living your life out under that arc of justification. It's there the whole way from A to Z covering everything. Your your forgiveness is constantly above you. You're accessing it all the time. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that makes sense. So I, do you mean it in the sense of Sins you commit after you come to faith are also covered, or yes, yeah, yeah, yeah I, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I guess like so. What, what I, I mean, differentiate between I'm, the I'm saying God? there is David, for example. David is a believer when he says, "Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven." Mm. So why did Paul cite a believer, a man already in many years in faith, talking about justification by faith, which reputedly happens when you come to faith? Well, I don't. I don't think uh, David is talking directly from his. For, I mean, directly like he's not talking in the moment of being justified. He's 
because his Paul says in verse six, he's speaking of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. It's not David himself who he's talking about. It's just any man that 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 has his has a uh, righteousness credited to him by God. Okay, but the context is David. If you go back to the psalm, David is already a believer. And he's saying that he's receiving forgiveness. Well, in in the in the quotation there in verses seven to eight, it says that he, he has received forgiveness. Because it's speaking in the it's speaking in the past tense. Yeah, he, because he's recalling what's what's happened to him. God has forgiven him. Yeah. As a believer. You think he's talking talking about being forgiven as a belie- as yes. like a, after after being a believer? Yes, I get. So the I, th- I think if I, I think that where the, I think I see where the disconnect is. So, Angus, you're you're, you're like if you go to Psalm 32, David is basically saying like, I've sinned, but how blessed is me and anyone else whose transgression is forgiven. So like these sins he committed after he had faith in Christ, um, and so you're you're talking about it like, and so I, th- I think that. Hmm. Really, like, I think the, the oh, okay. disconnect here is more so like, okay, like, when does justification start? Like, are, like and I think Chris is in his, I think Chris is hearing this as like, you have to get re-justified every time. But I don't think that's what you're saying. No, no so, I, I, I'm saying that, so on, on you go, Christopher, sorry. Well, I was going to ask you, uh, are, are you saying like, like, when we when we commit sins you know in in our everyday life and we we it, we we know that we're committing a sin that are we already forgiven of that sin or do we have to confess it we have to acknowledge it in order to receive the forgiveness in our everyday life uh well that's a that's a question I was that a, we could come to later. <laughs> is, there, is that another? Is, is that another? Is that, is that another? Is that another topic? Is that a separate topic? I, I it's connected, but I think separate. Okay. I, I the way the way what I'm trying to say is when when we have when we become believers in Christ, the full salvation of Christ is given to us. His full coverage mm-hmm. is given to us, but it's not something that. We, we think of it as being given there the first moment we believe and we talk about this positional thing and whatever else. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's helpful and it's true as far as what it's saying. I'm saying when you look at Romans 4, it's talking about the life of faith. Mm-hmm. It's not talking about positional this or whatever that. It's talking about Abraham, the man of faith. When you look at Paul's doctrine of justification, uh, or even when he's talking about righteousness, Romans 117, the just shall what? Live by faith. by faith. Well, I actually I actually interpret that verse, the life there as being eternal life, like the life to come. Or the life to come. Yeah. I, I, I interpret that as be, as being the you know the or- State the per- glorification, the yeah, like in uh, heaven, you mean the new heavens yeah. and the earth, yeah. I, I suppose that's an extension of it. Um, I, the, I, I would, I would say though, <clears throat> that given the way Romans plays out, that the life is something that we have now and we live it. We, uh, as it says, uh, the just shall live by faith, and it talks about from faith to faith. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a living faith, and and I'm saying that that idea of a living faith <coughs> is is connected very inextricably connected to the idea of justification by faith. All right, right, because because Paul begins the letter by by talking about the obedience of faith. Right, so it's, it's faith. It's faith that produces obedience. Yes, uh, and or sorry, go ahead, Curtis. I was going to say, we, we constantly hear Paul uh, kind of recalling the gospel, almost like we have to 
in a sense, preach the gospel to ourselves over and over. You know, I, I seek to know nothing about you but Christ and Christ crucified. Uh, the gospel is of first importance. So it's almost like as we walk through our life through sanctification, we are continually recalling that justification. Yes, that, that justification was done by Christ. And all our sins, like you were saying, past, present, and future, um, are, 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 are taken care of. But we are we're walking a life that continually remembers what Christ has done. And that's, I think, when we think of the Lord's table, we're kind of rehashing that justification, uh, um, that, that, that great pinnacle of history. You know what I mean? And bringing, bringing that back up. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say I'm into that, but I would add something else. I'd say it's, it's all of that and more. It's, it's not merely the remembrance part, it's the fact that justification is right now busily doing its work. It's completed, but it's completed to be an active force, as it were. We, we live under the constant safety umbrella of justification. It's, it's like... Something. Sorry. I apologize. I'm sorry. It's like when you put on Christ, put on that, put on that shiny yes. garment. You know? Yes, exactly. You put on, it's like you're putting on justification. It's done, it's finished, but you've got to, as Paul says, you've got to live out your salvation. You've got to live with that on you. Um, it's, it's the same theology, but different uh, angle that I think, anyway, you find in the first epistle of John where he talks about uh, Jesus as a propitiatory sacrifice. He doesn't right. mean that he's going to keep dying like the Roman Catholics teach. He's he's always dying. It's mean it's one and done, mm -hmm. but it's always effective for every single occasion. It's that, again, it's that umbrella art thing that is active and moving from faith to faith to faith, and it's alive in that sense. Right. So like any act of David or Abraham where they are lying by faith automatically becomes a proof of that coverage of justification that not only is given there once at the beginning, once and for all, but it's alive and active, that it's there all the time. Does that make sense? It makes so, sense. It doesn't make sense. I'm not sure I'm following. <laughs> Ang so can, I, can I ask a question, Angus? Yeah, sure. Uh, to try to get what you're saying. Um, are you basically saying that um, anytime we at, we exercise faith in Christ, um, that ought to remind ourselves of our innocent status before God? Is, is that basically what you're saying? I, I'm saying that the life of faith is a life where the righteousness of God is covering us at every action of faith. It's a life where Christ's righteousness is over us from A to Z. His justification right. covers us every step of the way that we live by faith. It's not just the, like I would call it the reformed ordo salutis model where you receive justification and then the fruits or uh, the effects of it are knocked on to you or passed on to you throughout your Christian life. Mm -hmm. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm saying it doesn't say everything. I'm saying that the justification that we have is in Christ himself. Mm -hmm. He is our righteousness. Right. And he covers us from A to Z. His life covers us from A to Z. Right. Uh, his righteousness, his justification covers us from A to Z, as does his propitiation. This is pretty much perseverance of the saints, if you think about it. it We're going to persevere. That, that's another doctrine that comes well, under the same principle. They all do, I think. They all come under that umbrella arc principle where... Um, you, you've got uh, the definitive and then you've got it covering you from A to Z. Well, I don't, Angus, I, I'm just not, I'm not, I don't understand how, how any other, any true believer would disagree with you, would, would disagree with your view well, of, ju of, ju of justification. 
Well, because <laughs> because I'm, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. Besides, uh, besides those who think our justification is dependent dependent upon our will, I, I suppose, upon our our well, our our own willingness to to trust in Christ. Right. I, I um, mean, but, but any any anyone who believes that that. Uh, faith is the gift of God that God sustains our faith. So we're always going to have faith in Christ. Um, I don't see how how they would disagree with you that once we're justified, we're always justified. So God, once God has declared us righteous and treated us as as innocent, He's not going to He's not going to you know change His mind and treat us as gu guilty afterward right right and, and of course we are, that's the point i'm making but more i i'm saying that the righteousness of god is it's not just that we are once and forever justified which is true it's saying that that once and forever justified uh, action that righteousness is effectively working every single moment we live by faith and it's covering us from A to Z of faith. It's a living, buzzing, alive justification. It's not just a reward. It's not just not a reward. What the heck? It's not just a a blessing given to us at the beginning that then has no con mm -hmm. effects. It's with us the whole way, protecting us. Right. Can I take you to a different passage? Sure. But go to pro one. Pro John. Pro prove it to me. Oh, well, this is <laughs> illustrative rather than proving that. Well, 1 John to, chapter 1. You ought to be able to prove it. Uh, actually, chapter 2. Chapter 2. It says in verse 2 that Jesus himself is the propitiation for our sins, but not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, you could read that one of two ways. Jesus is constantly propitiating the Father for our sins. Or you could read it that the one propitiation that's already been done covers us every single moment and satisfies God every single moment. And by faith, we access it every single moment, that completed propitiation. So what's the what's the first to you again? It is well, we are constantly having our sins propitiated. God, God our sins are being propitiated, but okay. then that, then then we are effectively, without knowing it, we're making ourselves Roman Catholics and offering up the mass on the altar and right. constantly having our sins propitiated and having to re-crucify Christ all over again. Mm -hmm. I think what John is saying here that Jesus literally says here. He himself right. is the propitiation. Right. So that the satisfaction. The risen Lord here who's already died, who's already propitiated. Mm -hmm. And as the risen Lord, he embodies that propitiation that covers us from A to Z, living by faith. Mm -hmm. So yep. take that same model and apply it to the, his justifying righteousness. It's the same deal. Uh it's once for all, he, he it's embodied in him, he goes into heaven, it cover us, covers his church now uh, from A to Z of its faith. So mm -hmm. then you can legitimately use that model, if you're Paul, to refer, and you can cite David or Abraham, who were already men of faith, who, ha who accessed that faith within their lives as believers okay and his and that makes sense because <clears throat> if you do not have the ordo salutis reform due then you're not going to start right at the beginning necessarily and only there and then have that knock-on effect you are most likely going to access men who were already living by faith so are are you just saying that justification applies to every single individual one of our sins in, instead of viewing justification as uh, covering covering our 
like our account with God so that at the beginning our account is our account is settled and so it's, we're free it, it, but cool. instead of instead of that instead of okay it's both it is both it, it's saying that our righteousness is full and we are fully forgiven I, I I'm not giving you a full-blown uh, theological exposition of you know everything that Christ does I'm giving to you a particular angle to justification of very few that that go, that has been lost. So this I can, Sorry, you go. Can, I, can I ask another question? Are you saying are you saying that every time we every time we sin because of our faith in Christ, God declares us righteous every time we sin? No. Is there, oh, okay. Okay. I'm saying that the righteousness that Christ is a righteousness. He is uh, He is God's righteousness. It tells you that right. in Ephesians right. uh, Romans 3. What he has done for us means that he embodies our redemption, our righteousness. He is all these things. He is right. them. That means he is all these things for us. Mm -hmm. And by faith, we are covered by them, access them every single moment. Right. That completed redemption, that completed so, righteousness. So, okay, is the distinction you're making then? <coughs> let me let me let me ask another question. Excuse is the distinction you're making that your view, which I don't disagree with, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to find out how it's distinctive from any, uh, any other believer that believes in the perseverance of the saints and that our faith is sustained by God. Um, are you saying that our faith is instead of instead of our faith being uh, being uh, uh, an initial an initial thing that we exercise, we're we're exercising our faith constantly every day. Is that is yeah. that the is that the distinction that it's it's, yeah. it's 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 faith it's faith that's it's not it's not a a faith that we have at the beginning. And then, then we go on with the other aspects of Christian living, like obedience. You're saying that um, every single day we're trusting in Christ for our righteousness. Yes. Uh, and if I were to put that into the language of justification, it means that the, the justified one is the one who's living by faith and his justification. It's not only that it was done once and for all and therefore has a knock-on effect the rest of his life that justification is over him the rest of his life the just shall live by faith okay from faith to faith mm -hmm. why gotcha. would you talk about from faith to faith when he's talking about justification by faith if it's a once for all event merely at the beginning of the christian life why talk about from faith to faith why talk about the just shall live by faith? Why go on to Romans 4 and talk about the life of faith by the man Abraham? Why all this living and ongoing nature of the Christian faith and life gotcha. and justification, according to the reform model, is a one and done deal merely to do in the order salute scheme of things at the beginning, and mm -hmm. then it has <clears throat> A kind of knock-on effect and you've got the benefits of it but it's one and done i agree it's one and done but the way it's then shaped by paul i think is different to so the reform model so can i can i um uh could could your view be um could the the slogan of your view be once justified always justified is it well, for sure Okay, so uh, I guess my my again I, I think I think I get what you're saying, but I think I'm a little bit with Christopher on trying to find the, the distinction, and I think it might just be with work because of the word choice. Um, so all right, so we've got you know Romans one um, that uh, that the justice of God is revealed from or from or by faith to faith. So it, it's this idea of you know. Basically, the faithful people will then you know, live unto faith, um, right? The righteous will live by faith. And so Romans 4, he's got this talking about Abraham for the purpose of saying, well, he talks about David, right? To, start, or to say that, you know, we're just, we're made right in the eyes of God. We're justified. 
um, mm -hmm. uh, by trusting in him, not by working. Right. And and what and so how are we made righteous? Well, our sins are forgiven. So we're right in God's eyes because our sins are forgiven. And he's already said that's, you know, through Christ. Um, and so then you and then he says, look, you, we have this example of Abraham who was clearly right in God's eyes by faith prior to circumcision. So circumcision is definitely not what does it because it wasn't there when he was when, when he was uh, declared righteous by God. Yeah. And then he talks about all the times Abraham believed. And then in Romans five, he ultimately ends up with. So we're declared righteous when we're in Christ. So it seems like there, justification is referring to that being declared righteous. Yes. And then, and so, and then you like, just like a sinner is declared sinful, like from birth forward because they're an Adam, hmm. a, a saint is declared righteous from belief forward, from faith forward because of Christ. And so just like a sinner sins, you know, a righteous person has faith and, you know, lives righteously. That's all. That's Romans 6. So it, it. Would you call that life of righteousness of both faith, both trusting God and living, you know, in a way that's in line with that? Would you call that a result of justification or part of justification? I'd say that the language we use the type of language that you've used is perhaps needing to be modified. That's what I would say. Okay. I would say that we have to get back to Christ as being the center. Sure. Christ, and, and that that's not a platitude because we're NCTers. I really mean it. Christ is our righteousness. He, he mm -hmm. is our justification. He is our redemption. And, and so on. He is, the, he is their propitiation. And I, I go back to the propitiation example because I think perhaps it, it might fling light on things. Christ is a once for all propitiation. It's done. It's, it's over and done mm. with. But yeah, Paul uses the present tense. Uh, John, he himself is mm -hmm. the propitiation for the sins of the world. Now, how right. can that be? I thought well, that we already propitiated. Well, in context, he, he says that he, before that, right before that, he says he's the advocate. Yes. Uh, be, before the Father. Yes. But the he, it's, it's equating Christ himself with the propitiation. Mm -hmm. As the risen advocate, he is the propitiation because because he embodies the propitiation that he achieved on the cross. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a living propitiation. We know that because of the present tense. He right. is our propitiation. Now there's a there's a paradox. He's already died. The propitiation is completed. Now he takes that with him. He is the living propitiation, not the sense that he constantly dies. Right. Right. But that successful propitiation is now with us from A to Z, and we access it by faith. It's a one-and-done deal. It has to be because Christ died one time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Our sins were propitiated once and for all one time. We access the success, the, the wonder of his propitiation, and we receive the benefits of that through faith. Mm -hmm. But it's already done. Right. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here now? So right? I guess you said you wanted the words to be modified. So you said the way I was using justification, you know, would, it was not quite right. Um, so I, I think I agree, like, that all the things you say are happening are happening. Uh, I guess I, so it seems to me that, and, I, and justification and said is used differently, you know, in different parts of the Bible. Um, right, you know, if nothing else, James versus Paul, um, or wisdom being justified by your children. Um, but... I guess like when we talk about like salvation justification, like the Romans, you, Paul's use of justification in Romans, that seems to be this, as you say, one and done thing. And then there's many results of that. Um, and we have, and there's this idea that you continue believing and like that, like it's, so it's a persistent justification, right? It's not like God says you're, so is that, is that what you're trying to get at? That it's persistent, that God not only said you were justified, but can or said you're right in his eyes, but continues to say that? 
declare that in in one sense but it's more it's more just saying that the the righteousness that Christ is our righteousness is found in the person it's not a it's not a blessing as such kind of floating and oh. him. he is a righteousness it's him who is a righteousness I see what so what so what you're emphasizing what you're emphasizing is that the reason we're justified is because of our union with Christ uh, through faith we, we we by faith we are covered by the righteousness of Christ however you there's a whole debate in that right I don't want to get pulled into <laughs> because that, <right>? because we're <laughs> because well because we're in Christ God treats us as if we as if we had the same human status as him so because he's innocent we're innocent right yes uh, but I would I again can I change the the spin on it? Sure. Christ is my righteousness. Right. It's, it's Him who covers me. Right. And uh, and I'm I'm stressing Him because it's a complete and done deal. The, the justif justification we have is found in Him uh, because He died on the cross for us, and now because He is the risen Lord. And he covers us from A to Z. By faith, we live in union with him. Mm -hmm. We live by faith in the Christ. And the justification that he is, he embodies, because he procured it for us, it's over us every single second. It's right. over us like his propitiation is over us every single second. From the, the moment we first come to faith, that's where we enter into the fullness of it. But then it covers us. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I suppose if you could put it like this, and this is a poor illustration, so please forgive me. It's kind of like a, a building. You walk into it, you walk into the fullness of the building, but you still have to travel to the end of the building. But that yep. building is from, it's the one building, and it covers you from A to Z. We have kind of limited justification by faith to that initial walking in the door and it stops mm -hmm. dead there and i'm saying well okay yeah you're entering into it and it's covering you from a to z right but i don't see a People difference i don't see a difference between that and saying that once god has justified you that's your that's your that's your status you're justified yes uh, you are no, you're he, justified he declares you righteous so, so, it, but he declares you right because justification is simply it's simply a legal way of speaking of forgiveness of sins or or not counting not God not counting our sins against us for the sake of Christ. So, oh, okay. So, I, I, let me try and I will try one more time to tease out the 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 problem. Romans four, you've got two men who are already believers. Mm -hmm. If you're going to if let's say we're working from the reform model. And by the way, the reform model here isn't Calvin's model, but let's say this reform model and an ordo salutis. Justification is located in one place alone. When mm -hmm. you initially come to faith, you're justified. Right. And after that is sanctification, before it is regeneration. So it's so it's justification not justification is right in between regeneration according to the reform model right. and sanctification. That's where it's stopped. That's where it's so. So, in other words, the reformed the reformed view of justification is it's 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 a a one time event rather than a status that 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 is given to you well, because it, because of your union with Christ. Well, it is. A, I would argue it is a one time. Of, I, I mean, I'm, it's. I'm, I, I know. But but I'm, they stop. But they stop there. You're saying. Yes. Whereas their own father, Calvin, talks about the ongoing nature of justification. He doesn't mean you're constantly being justified. He means right. that the, the justification of Christ constantly covers you from A to Z as you right. live by right. faith. Right. Now, and, I, I, and I'm saying that's what Paul is teaching. He's teaching the same thing. Now, do you, well, I guess I have a maybe a textual question, but just extra biblically. So are you saying that Reformed people don't believe that once you are declared righteous, you are like that. Don't, isn't that part of the belief that you are 
continuously justified, and that's why, you know, you can't lose your salvation in that view? Uh, yes, I, I, I mean, again, I would agree with that, but I, I am saying that it doesn't go far enough. I think Calvin gets a, he gets a better. He's saying that the righteousness of Christ, he puts it on Christ. He covers us with his righteousness. We enter into huh. that definitively when we believe. We live under it the rest of our days. We access it the rest of our days just like we access his propitiation the rest of our days. He is our propitiation. Okay, okay. so he then I guess... Is yeah, our righteousness. My, my follow-up there is then, I guess, from chapter 4, because uh, I was looking in Jeremiah where it says a couple times, uh, Yahweh is our righteousness, or they will say Yahweh is our righteousness, and like right. what that and that, that tends to be with him, like, instituting justice. So in Romans 4, um, you've got... Just uh, verse six, just as David also speaks, or I'm sorry, verse five, to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take onto account. Um, so he, there he seems to say that this righteousness that we're credited um is the, like what that actually is, is having our sins forgiven. And so when we say we are, or when you say we're covered in Christ's righteousness, uh, so at least my reading of at least this particular passage is that Jesus, you know, implicitly is the one here taking away the sin so that they're not against us. So he's sort of subtracting. I don't see the covering part of that equation here. Right, verse seven. But the, the covering part comes from the fact he's already a believer. The traditional model, again, is that you're once forever justified. It's a right. done deal. It doesn't come to someone who is a believer. It's already done. So why does it come to a believer when he's already justified? That's the big question. Okay, so, okay, okay, okay. Maybe maybe I have, maybe I have um, something that might connect with what you're saying. So <clears throat> our justification um, our justification is not only okay, so it's instead of being the the beginning of our status with God, it's it's the beginning and it's also every time we sin, the justification covers that it covers the each and each and every individual sin. Instead of be, instead of it being a status, it's it's the justification is is um <clears throat> it's an act of God that that covers I, I can't say it any other way, but every every other every sin that we commit. That, is yes. that, what, that what you're saying? Instead of instead of I it know. being instead of it being like I, a status or a position it's it's an act of god god justifies us i mean well i can't think of it in another way but every time every time every time we sin we're justified right uh I no i wouldn't say that i would say we're already it's a once and all justification we're accessing it it's the same idea. What, what you're suggesting there is Luther's view, where every time you confess your sin, mm -hmm. you are you've got a mini justification. No, I'm not even saying confessing your sin. Even if you don't, if you even even if you don't confess it, you're, no, ju I, you're justified. I, I, I can see what I can see what you're saying, and I I just see right uh, justification as being as the traditional view, a one and done deal. I'm simply saying that. Um, it covers us in the life of faith in a, in a way that we are not used to thinking about. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason why we're not used to thinking about it in that way is because of the Reformed Order Salutis. Well, I'm used yeah. to thinking about it in the way that you've been speaking of it. Because I, I, I didn't grow up in, I didn't, I wasn't indoctrinated with Reformed theology, so. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> you were blessed. I think, I think what we're looking at, and I may be oversimplifying things, 
But I think when we come from what the reformers spoke of, they were really grappling on how to kind of forensically define things, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think when we look at their facet, we get that forensic def definition. And, I, I, and there's probably much writings from the reformers that deal with kind of what Angus is talking about. But I, I also do <clears> think <throat> that we get that facet of not only standing in our justification, but walking in our justification as we read the text. And it just may be a semantic issue you know, I think it is. Uh, I yes, I would say yes, but no, because the the difference being this: the new covenant hermeneutic is centered on Christ Himself, and the reform language is about us. It mm -hmm. starts with us believing in Christ, and it's it's as if we are taking we. It's it's too much about us in our mm -hmm. relationship to Christ, whereas Again, sorry to go back to 1 John 2. Um, it's Christ who is our righteousness or Christ mm -hmm. who is our propitiation. This is done. We have already entered into it. It's a finished work, but we constantly access Christ himself. Mm -hmm. We constantly put on Christ himself. And there's too much. This is one of the things where some have critiqued the reform view because... Um, it's as if Christ gets put on and then he's forgotten and then it's all mm -hmm. about yeah, that's one of the big critiques of the Reformed Order Salutis and I'm saying that Christ I'm arguing that Christ is over us from beginning to end right. and by faith we live in that uh, his safety and it covers us from beginning to end and it's called adoption, it's called justification it's called redemption, it's called propitiation, whatever you want to name it, it's called all of those things. And it covers us by the life of faith from A to Z. Yeah. It doesn't mean we're constantly being adopted, regenerated, constantly being redeemed. It means nothing of the sort. We're, we're under a one and done deal, but it covers us from A to Z. And so yeah. the biblical writers, uh, in this case Paul, can access... Uh, the life of faith of mature believers and connect it directly into justification by faith. I, I think a good verse. Uh, now, now I would I would actually I would actually argue with uh, whether or not Abraham was a mature believer when he was credited to Abraham, but that's I guess that's a side issue. Well, uh, yeah, I, think I just mean he's been a believer for a while. Okay. Whether he was spiritually okay. mature, I'll leave that to your discretion. Okay. I, he was a he was a believer Sorry. for some time, and this has caused a lot of difficulty for exegetes. They have asked this question, and theologians have struggled with it. But I think Calvin produced the answer. I think he was right. Okay. And I, yeah. Sorry, comes. I think a good verse to kind of exemplify the maybe to lend a little more weight to the side that you're talking about would be do not grieve the Holy Spirit uh, for whom you are sealed by the day of redemption. So you got kind of an ongoing process. Not, I'm not saying justification uh, yeah. is is a, a process where you're, you're becoming um, what I'm talking about is the believer is living out his sanctification. And as he walks through that life. He's continually looking back to what he's sealed to. What am I sealed to for that day of redemption? My justification, you know? Yeah. I, I, yes, I, I, it's the same process. I agree with Luther in as much as you have the big, uh, like he talked about the, the example of Christ saying uh, you are clean, but you need to have mm -hmm. your feet clean. Mm -hmm. I, I agree in part with Luther there in as much as you're, You've got the one and done deal, it's already done, and you're con 